Hello there, Pastor Josh Shelton here at Redemption Church. I just want to take a second and say thank you for watching this sermon recording. I truly hope and pray that it is an encouragement to you. And if it is, would you please consider giving to Redemption Church? You can do that by going to our website, redemptiongillette.com. Again, I just pray that this is a blessing and an encouragement to you. Thank you for watching. All right, today Josh is starting a new sermon series through the book of Joshua. So we are starting uh, the line in the sand, beginning in Joshua chapter 24, verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from behind, beyond the river and led them through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And I gave Esau the hill country of Sire to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterward, I brought you out. And then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come up upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. And then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land. And I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zip Zippor, the king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam the son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand, and you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I gave them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, and the king, two kings of the Amorites. And it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and the olive or orchards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whom, whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. All right, there we go. Thank you, Cindy, for reading that. Um, so we are going to be starting this new series, um, Line in the Sand. We aren't, it's not all going to be in Joshua. Just this week, we're going to be in the book of Joshua. You probably be wondering, like, wow, are we just going to be focusing on the last chapter of Joshua for a couple weeks? No, we're not. That would be good, but we're not. Um, let me, before we get started, to get too far here, I want to say a couple things. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Josh. I am the lead pastor here at Redemption Church. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I would love the opportunity to meet you this morning. Uh, we have some connect cards there in the back table, just if so you can fill out, that we just have a way of us following up with you and getting to know you a little bit better. But we also have a gift bag at Redemption Central just to say thank you for joining us this morning. I also want to mention, add a couple people to that list of help helpers this week. It was, it was a, a big job, a lot bigger than I anticipated it being, um, and we didn't get done. But, and I know like if you look at this side of the south side of our house, we live right next door here, by the way, in the parsonage, and you look at the siding on that house, and it's got three different colors of siding, and it still looks better than it did before. 
So, uh, if you can imagine, if you didn't know what it looked like before, just trust me, it looks better than it did. Okay, uh, but I also want to mention just a couple of the people. Paul and Nathan helped a ton this past week, and I want to say thank you guys for helping this week as well. Uh, but that went really well, and if you are able to this week at any point, literally at any point, let me know, and I will find a way and we'll put you to work because there's going to be a lot of work to do this week as well. But let's go ahead and let's get started here. We are in the last chapter of Joshua this morning, Joshua 24, starting in verse 1. Before we get too carried away, we've been doing this lately, and, and I love, it's not like this isn't new, breaking new ground, but I, I, I love to just pause for a moment before we get too far and just pray as we go into God's word. Father God, I thank you for this time. I do pray that, Lord, as we open up your word, that you would please speak to us through your word. Open our hearts and our minds today to hear what you have for us. May we understand and may we glean and may we grow because of your word today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alrighty, so as Cindy mentioned, we are starting this new series. It is called Line in the Sand. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you, uh, maybe there was a line drawn, a decision made, where you said, this is what I'm going to do or this is what I believe no matter what? Some of you, you might point to that, that moment where you accepted Christ and you said, this, this is the moment that I believe and everything from here on out is going to be filtered through a different lens. Everything in this moment is going to change everything beyond this moment. There's a line in the sand. It was a moment of great conviction, of commitment to follow through no matter the cost. Now, that doesn't have to just be a decision for Christ. I mean, that's probably the most important decision we could ever make. But, but there's also other decisions that we can make there or you might feel like this is the moment where we're going to do something different here. I, 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 for me, I, I, my story is in July 3rd, 2007, I accepted Christ. July 3rd, 2008, I received the call to ministry. So the exact same day, a year later, God was like, you're going to be in ministry. And then he spent several years clarifying what that actually was going to look like and preparing me. It wasn't like I, God was like, you're going to be in ministry. And at 16 years old, boom, I jumped into ministry. I wasn't ready. There's days now where I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Right? God is continuing to grow and prepare me and equip me for the calling that he's given me. But that was a line in the sand. That was a moment where it's like, okay, everything is going to be different now. Everything is going to be filtered through a different lens. Now there's a line in the sand. And that's what this series is about. We're going to look at four stories of faithfulness to God. So God is faithful. We're going to look at faithfulness to God. But more than that, it, it, it's the faithfulness to God, remained faithful to God in the face of opposition, in the face of persecution, in the, in the face of great danger there's, they remain faithful. And so as we go through this series, ask that question of yourselves, where do you draw the line in the sand? Where are those moments where you say, okay, this far and no further. And everything else in my life is going to, to be filtered through that decision. So this morning we start in the book of Joshua. And if you're unfamiliar with, or maybe it's been a while uh, with, you've been, since you've been in J Joshua, there's no problem. It, it, here's, here's the book of Joshua in a nutshell. I'm going to boil it down. And for some of you like Old Testament nerds, you're going to probably, this is going to dri drive you nuts. But uh, I'm going to boil this down really, really quickly. So chapters 1 through 12, are you ready? Chapters 1 through 12, Joshua led God's people to enter and conquer the, the, the people and the land that their parents and ancestors would not. So God said, here, go into the land of Canaan, this land that I've promised for you that's good, this is your land, this is what I've given to you. And Moses and the descendants here, their parents, uh, they're like, nope. And then the, what did they do? Because of their disobedience, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And then you see here, Moses, he dies, a lot of the, those people die off, and Joshua is leading them now into this land. And they are to conquer this land. And so that's what they spend the first 12 chapters of Joshua doing. And then 13 through 22 is the division and the distribution of the land amongst the 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, it's the nine and a half tribes because we already see that, that two, two and a half tribes were actually already given land east of the Jordan River. And now the rest of them are being allotted land on the west side of the river. And then the last two chapters, so we're doing 24, so 23 and 24, you get to this moment where jo Joshua is at the end of his life, makes it really, really clear that he's old. Really, it says it over and over and over again. He's really, really old. 
And he, he has a few things to communicate to the people. He's reminding them of that calling. He's reminding, reminding them of that line in the sand where God has called them to something. And, he's, and, he, and this, this covenant to, with God, this renewal of this covenant with God right before he dies. And so the book of Joshua is said to be one of the hardest books to preach from. If you're not familiar with it, let me explain why. It's not because it's, it's, it's hard to understand or because there's a lot of textual criticism. It's hard potentially to preach through the book of Joshua because of what God is calling his people to do. God instructs his people through Joshua to not just conquer, but utterly destroy those nations in their path to the promised land. So not just, not just conquer them and possess the land. He's saying, wipe everybody out. Wipe, wipe everything out, okay? And as we see evidenced in chapter 24, we're going to see here in a moment, idolatry is one of the biggest reasons such destruction was necessary. If these nations were simply conquered, God's people would inevitably fall into sin and idolatry again. You know, as I mentioned, Joshua says that he's old and he's advanced in years. And at this moment, the nation of Israel is, is doing really, really well. Everything's gone well. They've, they've gone through and possessed most of the land. They possessed it, not necessarily conquered it. There's still peoples to be conquered. But they possess the land, and everything is pretty, going pretty well for them right now. And after that, Joshua, as their leader, he's, he's the last leg of his race, and he's going to remind them at the same, of the same covenant that, that started the book, he's, he's carried, that has carried the Israelites up to this point. So if you recall, back in, in Joshua 1, what does he say? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous, right? He, he reminds them that if you follow God, there are all these amazing blessings and things to happen. And if you don't follow God, don't expect it to go well. Don't expect it to go well. The covenant established between Moses and God, known as the Mosaic Covenant or Book of the Law, is what Joshua is referring to. The essence, by the way, of that covenant is kind of twofold. You have, like I just mentioned, you have blessing and curse. So if you follow God, if you remain faithful, if you obey his commands, there will be blessing. But if you don't follow God, if you choose to follow something else, you choose to worship something else, if you disobey God's commands, there's going to be curses on you. Bad things are going to happen. There's going to be consequences of that. Now, after they had conquered the lands, the great danger, especially without Joshua's leadership, they would let their guard down. And isn't that how it happens? We, we are most vulnerable when everything is going well, when we have peace and when we have plenty and everything is going our way and we slowly, gradually, we let our guard down, don't we? Joshua warned the nation of Israel what would happen if they let their guard down. It would gradually change their attitude towards these pagan nations. It would change their attitude towards these foreign gods. Their tolerance would grow until they replaced these pagan gods with the real God. Or worse, that they would worship the real God and these pagan gods at the same time, side by side. And, he, and Joshua was aware of this and he was warning them of this. Now, I think we can see an application point there for our lives. God's people were to remain holy. What does holy mean? It means set apart. They were to remain faithful. Their temptation for sin and other gods would grow until it was unbearable because they had grown tolerant. I don't think when we go through Joshua, and then we're just spending, we're going through the last chapter and kind of hitting the end notes and then going to go on in this series. But I don't think it's appropriate to go through Joshua and take away from there that we're supposed to have um, to commit violence towards others. Nor do I think it, it is a call to separate ourselves from the world. Right? That's not the example that we see from Jesus. He's not saying, oh, see all this, these people here? Distance yourself from all these people that don't look like Jesus. That's not what the takeaway is. Instead, we are to remain in the world, but not of the world. That's what it says in the high priestly prayer of John 17, right? To remain in the world, but not of the world. And in order to do that, we must do three things. We are to remain faithful to the one true God. There's one true God. It's not God plus, God this, God that, right? I mean, we don't get to choose who God is or what God is in our lives. There's one true God. We need to remain faithful to him. The second thing is we need to remain vigilant to the devil's schemes, to be aware of that temptation to sin. See, you, got, you, and, you and I, we're going to continue to sin after we are Christians. 
But I don't want to grow so numb and, or tolerant of sin that the world can't tell the difference between someone who is sinning and someone who doesn't know Jesus and me. I don't want somebody to, 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 to look at somebody that's not a Christian and somebody that is a Christian and be like, I have no idea what the difference is. The statistics are the exact same. All the, the rates of, uh, of all these different things, all this different sin in our lives, it, it's the exact same whether you're a Christian or you're not Christian. I want to be set apart for God. I want to be vigilant of what the temptations and the sin is that Satan is going to try to scheme me into. And the third thing is, is to obey his commands. To obey his commands. Only this time around, on this, this side of the cross, God's people, you and I, can rest in the grace and the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This isn't just a list of rules that we have to follow perfectly, and if we don't, we're out of the club. Thankfully. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of our hearts, making us holy all while being in the world, not separate from it. The ability to remain faithful and holy no longer falls solely on us. And that's, a very, that's very, very good news. Hopefully that should, should, should be good news to you. Because we, like the Israelites, would surely fail and die in our own sins. I know I've, I've experienced that in my own life, in my own heart. When I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to stop doing this. And I'm committed to stop doing this. And I, and I draw the line in the sand in my own strength, in my own power. Guess what? I'm going to fail. At some point, I'm going to cross over that line. At some point, I'm going to fail. I'm not going to be able to do that. And I have these moments of victory and success in life and those, th those areas and some things that, you know what I mean? And, and you, we, we draw that line in the sand on our, on our own strength and it doesn't work. It would just be that. It would just be these moments and these seasons of victory and success. Look what, it's, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. He says this, Everyone... Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall. It is fleeting and meaningless to build our house on sand. And I think about that analogy, and a lot of times I think we read that and we're like, oh, yeah, that's dumb. Obviously, if you build a, a castle of sand, it's not going to be useful. It's not going to last. But that's not what he's saying here. He's talking about the foundation, right? He's talking about the foundation here. Jesus is saying if you build your house with good materials, with the right cement mixture, with the right kind of wood, with the right kind of siding, and the right kind of, as we're residing the house, it's really good siding. I'm thankful for that. The right kind of siding and the right kind of roofing, and you use all the right materials, but you don't make sure that the foundation is right. It will neither be helpful nor lasting. We need the right foundation first. That is, that is that we need to follow God and believe in his son, Jesus. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, where does Joshua 24 come into all of this? <laughs> so with that backdrop, let's get into Joshua 24. The first thing that we see in the first four verses is this history lesson, right? Cindy read it for us as history from Abraham, one through four, to Moses, five through seven, then to Joshua, eight through 13. And then we get into this conquest, more accurately, possession for the land that they, they, that they didn't conquer, the, excuse me, possession for, they didn't actually conquer the land as they were commanded. And then we get to the end the ver there, verse 13, and it's all about the distribution, and in 14, this is where I want to go to this morning. In 14, it says this. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. In 15, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we 
will serve the Lord. And so that therefore right there, if we back up to verse 14, that therefore he's pointing back to everything that he's just said. He's pointing back to this history lesson that he's just given them. Because of this history in particular, what God has done, right? He said not by, by their sword or by their bow, what God has done, he said, I gave, I sent, I delivered by God's power, by God's might. If you go back and you read 1 through 13, there's, I think it's like 21 times that th- there's a reference to God there. And this emphasis, as it always is, is and rightfully so, is, is on God doing the work, God sending, God defending, God providing, God protecting. Because of whom God is, Joshua says, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Simply, he's referring to God's track record, and he sees this is the God that you need to follow and obey. This is the God worth following. All these other gods and these, of these pagan nations around you aren't real, and they aren't worth following. Look to this God. Look to what God has already done for you, this track record. This isn't like a track record you point back and you're like, oh, see what they did for those people over there. You know, he's like, see what they've done for you. Have you so easily forgotten See what they've done for you. You know, we talk about it all the time at Redemption Church. We were created by God to be worshipers. Say it another way, you will worship something. You will. We all will. But here's a little secret. We also want to worship something that we think is worthy of worship. Right? Right? Because if you're like, oh, I worship, the, I worship this thing. Let's say it's a video game. And I worship this video game. But you don't actually think that that video game is worth your worship. And, and maybe if, you, if somebody would point out that you're actually worshiping that video game, well, that's ridiculous. Why would I worship a video game? But that's how in our actions and our lives we are, are worshiping something other than God. You see what I'm saying? We want to worship something that's worthy of our worship. Nothing besides God is worthy of your worship. Nothing. Consider God's faithfulness for a moment. Turn back to Joshua 23, 14 with me. Joshua 23, verse 14. Maybe it's on the same page there. And it says, Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God has promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. You know, you look back in verse, or excuse me, chapter 21, we see something also similar to this. Joshua is about to pass away, but his final message to God's people is that God is faithful. God can be trusted. God, you can actually, you can bank on God. You can, God is worthy of our worship. But even more, he says, he points to all the promises that God has made to his people. Every single one of them has been revealed in his time. Not a single one has failed. Think about that. Have you ever lied? Have you ever said something that you're like, I want this to come to pass? I believe this will come to pass. Maybe you believe it wholeheartedly. But you, there's things out of your control, aren't there? There's things in your life that you, you, don't, you don't get to have, to have a say in all the factors and all the things in your life and how something will work its, its way out. God, every promise, every word they spoke, it never failed. That is the God we worship. His faithfulness is so great that we can hardly articulate, let alone realize its entirety. We look to his fulfilled promises, his revelation of himself, and great displays of power to understand his faithfulness. And that is the faithfulness that Joshua references in his commitment to the Lord. He says, I know faithfulness because God is faithfulness, faithful to me. I actually I, I, I am, can talk about faithfulness, not because I myself am faithful, perfectly, always, great. I'm not the example, example of faithfulness. He's appealing to God here. He's saying faithfulness is real and good and true because God is faithful. Look at what he's done for you. Look at the promises that he's made for, to you. He does not fail. And then look at verse 15 again of Joshua, right? We, we, we just read this. This is probably one of the more uh, well-known verses a lot of people. I think, in fact, I even think in our house, there's a, there's a, a, pla- there's a uh, picture frame in our house of this verse. Um, but what does it say? It says, choose this day 
Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So he says, choose today. You have two options. Choose this day. You can choose the God of your fathers, the true, the one true God that I'm talking about, the the God that's worthy of worship, or you can choose literally anything else. (laughs) I mean, he he points to specific gods of the Amorites, right, and the pagan cultures and nations around him, but he says literally anything else would fit into that. He appeals to the people, choose this day whom you will serve. Essentially, he's saying to God's people who he has been given authority over, get off the fence. Get off the fence. It's been long enough. What are you waiting for? It's decision time. And then he says, here's my decision. Here's here's what I choose to do. Here, let me lead in this. Let me, me, by example, show you where I stand here. What I, whether I'm going to choose the gods of, God of our fathers, I'm going to choose these pagan gods over here. Let me show you. Let me lead by example. Here is my decision. As for me and my house, there's only one clear option. We are going to serve the Lord. And there's the line in the sand. There's the line in the sand. All the pressure and opposition to blend in with the Canaanites and to go with the flow, is that, is that what he's supposed to be doing here? Giving into that pressure, giving into that opposition, because you know there is pressure and opposition. You know, you, you read further down and you go on to the next book, guess what? There, that opposition, that, that, that pressure to give in and to, to, to worship the same gods of all these pagan nations around them is very real. It's not something that on the horizon, it's not a potential, it's there, it's in their midst, it's something that they're already doing. And he draws a line in the sand and he says, no more. He says, we are going to follow God, remain faithful, and obey his commands because they bring life. And in the last few verses of Joshua, we see four characteristics on display that we must recognize and imitate if we wish to draw a line in the sand. Four characteristics that um, over the next few weeks we're going to see as true and necessary for these, for these types of circumstances. It's more than just having faith in God. It's saying, okay, no matter what else, no matter what cost, this is the line. This is the line. Four things, four characteristics, and here they are. The first one is boldness. Boldness, the courage, and we see this in Joshua here, the courage to finally make a decision publicly, to choose once and for all where that line is. Now, I think Joshua had already made this decision. He'd already made this public. He'd already made it very clear where he stood. If you look back, Joshua was one of those characters where he was very aware of what was happening in the time of Moses and Aaron and these, these past ancestors, ancestors that decided that they didn't want to go into the promised land. Joshua was there. Joshua knew about that. Joshua was right there by Moses' side. He knew what was going on. And so he says here in this moment to these people, as he's on his deathbed, this is what I choose. There's no waffling, there's no wavering or indecisiveness. There is confidence in this decision. You don't, you don't make a decision and go back on it and be like, well, you know, I, I, I kind of had a tummy ache that day. And so when I made that decision, what I really meant was, there's no wavering on this decision. He says, there's, he's saying, this is my decision. There's this boldness there. The second thing is is faithfulness. This isn't a God plus kind of faith. Worship is directed and focused on God alone. When I'm using this word faithfulness here, I'm talking about loyalty. Okay? I'm talking about loyalty here. To have a spirit of worship in in how we live our lives. This means that we are devoted to him and that all of the decisions that we make and things that we say are filtered through what God wills for us. What that means is that if we are truly devoted to God, wholly devoted to God, then there's not a decision in my life that, doesn't, that isn't affected by God in my life, by my worship of who God is and what I know about God and what I believe about God and my faithfulness to him. We can't separate those two things in our lives and say, well, I can say whatever I want to my, to my family member and, and say how I'm really, really feeling. We can't separate those things and be like, no, God wants me to handle the relationships in my life and how I treat my family members and my co-workers and my children through the lens of who God is. 
I, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking at how do I worship God in my relationships? How do I worship God in my career and my purposes and the meaning of my life? Everything is filtered through that lens. We're loyal to him. Because it also means that we're not easily distracted by the temptations of the worship uh, of something else. Right? So you have these options here of, of God, the one true God. I'm going to choose him. He's true. He's, he's worthy of our worship. And then literally anything else to be faithful, to be loyal to him, is to not be distracted by those other things, to not be tempt- tempted. And you know what? You know what the greatest way to, to, to avoid temptation? Focus on God. Because if you're looking this way, you're not distracted by what's over here. It doesn't matter how good your peripheral vision is, you're not seeing behind you. Right? So focus on God. Focus on who he is. Focus on his promises and his faithfulness. Okay? And be faithful to him. Be loyal to him. Not distracted by what other things you could be worshiping. The third thing is steadfastness. Steadfastness. This is the line in the sand resoluteness. The firmness to stand by a decision made. A truth proclaimed and a line drawn. No matter what the people around me do, no matter if I am the only one swimming upstream, if that's where God sends me, I'm going to pray for strength and endurance, and I'm going to get started. And then the fourth thing, the fourth characteristic, is an awareness of the cost. It sounds, if you, if you read 19 through to the end there, um, through like 24, 25, it sounds as if Joshua is trying to talk them out of following God. Because he's like, choose this day whom you will serve. And they're like, okay, cool. Yeah, but we'll serve God. And he's like, no, 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 no. Understand what this is going to cost you. Understand what this means. Understand what the words that are coming out of your mouth actually mean. Don't just give lip service to God. Understand that you choose today to follow God. That's going to cost you something. He's trying to make sure that they understand the seriousness of the choice that they make. See, Joshua knew what he was going to lead. He knew that he was going to lead his family to do and what he was going to choose. And he leads in that. He leads in boldness and confidence in that decision. He draws that line, but he also was aware that that was not the only option, right? There's these other other options over here. He was there when Moses received the law. Are you familiar with the golden calf? Joshua was there. Joshua wasn't the one with Aaron and those people doing that. He was with Moses, but Joshua was there. He knew that this propensity to worship something other than God. And if you recall in that story, what happened right before the golden calf moment? God miraculously brought them out of and saved them out of Egypt. (laughs) It didn't take long for these worshipers with the law of action to to find something else to occupy their worshiping hearts. Joshua knew that they were predisposed to veer toward other gods. In fact, in verse 23, it implies that they are divided that they are divided in their loyalties already. He simply wanted God's people to understand what their options were and the consequences of each. They make a decision to follow God wholeheartedly, assuring, then he, then he makes a decision to follow God wholeheartedly, assuring that they know what is at stake too. Then you fast forward, what happens, if you're familiar at all with Old Testament history, Israelite history, what happens one book later? We get to Josh, or excuse me, we get to Judges. We get to Judges, and uh, man, Judges is a roller coaster. If you've never read through Judges, Judges is a roller coaster. It literally, quite literally, is like copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste, kind of, because because all of those different Judges. How does it start with? They they were doing well, and then they weren't doing well, and then God sent in a judge. Let's do this all over again, right? So you fast forward ahead in history, they do exactly what they promised and committed to not do. And this roller coaster ride of unfaithfulness with God's people. But I want to go back to those two options that Joshua gives, to follow God or to follow after anything else. Maybe for you that's job security. I've talked with a lot of people lately that, that the jobs are changing or jobs are up in the air or, or they're not content with their jobs. 
Maybe it's you find yourself maybe with job security or trusting in your future with your job more than you're trusting in God. Maybe that's subtly where your worship has shifted. Maybe it's in relationships or family. Maybe it's in wealth, lust, retirement. Maybe it's attention seeking, recognition, or power and in, in, in influence. Maybe you worship power and influence and you're willing to hurt and, and, and trample over anybody in your path to get what you want or to get where you, need, you think you need to be. Notice I very de- deliberately used the word consequence a moment ago. Did you notice that? To both of these options, there are consequences. You know, that, that, that word is most often used in a, in a negative connotation, right? If you do something bad, there's consequences for those actions. But really, in reality, it simply means a result of an action. So to both of these options, there are natural consequences. Another way to say this is that there is a cost either way. So if you follow God, if you follow God, which in our context means to have faith in his son, Jesus Christ, then you will obey what he instructs you to do and you will live in such a way that, that he tells you to live. You will follow him. But it will cost you something. You are liable to lose friends, to you lose jobs, lose money, dreams of a family, or possibly even your own life. You will be hated by those who don't see the world the same way you do. You will be mocked and persecuted. You will be cussed at, spit on, and ridiculed, all for the name of Christ. And you might someday, maybe in the near future, be given the choice between following God or following a worldly authority to which imprisonment or death may very well be likely. All of these are consequences of following God, all of which Scripture deems as honorable and worthy. Look look how the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians 3. This is powerful stuff. So he finishes uh, verse 3 there. He says, put no confidence in the flesh. In verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Think about that. I couldn't say that. You have, you have confidence in the flesh, you have confidence in your accomplishments and what you've done, right? In, from a worldly, secular perspective, you, 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 you can measure yourself up to anybody else and, and you have more. Five, circumcised on the eighth day of, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain, listen to this, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything. Right? You you, you put Paul and all of his accomplishments and everything that he's done up against literally anyone else he's saying. And he counts that as rubbish. I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Think about what he's saying there. Think about the power of that statement to say, everything else I have in life is but loss that I may gain Christ. Christ is more valuable, more worthy than anything else. Anything that I think that I'm good at or I, I bring into this world, anything that I think I, I, I bring a value into this world is rubbish compared to Christ. And Paul here is utterly aware of the cost to follow Christ. I don't want anybody to, to, to think or walk away from here thinking that you can, you can follow God, you can claim to, to be a Christian without it costing you something. It doesn't work that way. 
It will cost you something to follow and continue to follow God, but it'll be worth it. And then there's that other option, right? You fill in the blank, literally anything else that you choose to worship, anything else other than God, there's consequences there too. But before we talk about those consequences, please keep in mind to follow after something else very rarely is narrowed down to one thing in particular. But I, I suspect for um, some of us, maybe quite a few of us, we're guilty of attempting to worship both a worldly dream or pleasure and God at the same time. This was exactly what Joshua was warning God's people against. We can't worship God and anything else. This makes us poor worshipers at best. At, at, at best, it's poor worshipers because we aren't fully devoted to either. And in addition to being devoted to multiple things, there are grave consequences for pursuing and worshiping something other than God. To choose something other than God, literally anything else, fill in that blank. There's great consequences for that. But let's, let's assume... So, so these, all those worldly pursuits, they'll, they'll cause you to drift from worshiping the one thing that we were made to worship, which is God. But let's assume for a moment that you go down the other path. You choose to pursue and worship that other thing that promises great gain. It promises satisfaction. It promises fulfillment. It promises wealth or security or pleasure or family or power or, and prestige. But it never quite delivers, does it? Or at least it hasn't yet. Maybe you're still holding out hope that it will. But don't hold your breath. And let me tell you why you shouldn't hold your breath. Everything that we pursue apart from or in addition to God costs the same. It costs the same. Those things you are worshiping by way of pursuit are fleeting pleasures at best. If you're honest, they are ultimately unfulfilling and meaningless. And don't take my word for it. You go read the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, I was talking with a young man a few weeks ago who stopped in to talk in my office. Never met him before, doesn't go to this church. And everything, as he's, we start talking, everything seemed to be going fairly well for him in life, for the most part. According to his own words. In his own words, everything was going well. Yet something was missing, something seemed off, and he couldn't put his finger on it. And I had the opportunity to to share with him the hope of Jesus Christ. I told him that, that what was missing was the promising fulfillment of following and living for Jesus Christ. That what he was looking for and not finding was Jesus Christ. He needed to first place his faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then he would have a newfound meaning and purpose. Remember, because if you choose God, you worship God, everything else is filtered through that lens and changes your purpose and your meaning. To live for him and to follow after him. And, and this particular young man wasn't ready to make that decision. He wasn't ready to choose to follow him. But I gave him my contact information, I gave him a Bible, and I said I'd be praying for him. But as I said, don't take my word for it. You can go to Ecclesiastes. You might already have those experiences in your life. But every person that has gone before us in history has felt that pull and that tension of, can I reach my ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction in my pursuits? And everybody that has gone to the end, that's why I love the book of Ecclesiastes, because he went down every road. Everything that you pursue in this life, everything that you think will fulfill you apart from God, Solomon tried it. I know he tried all of them at once, right? Solomon tried it. And he realized at the end that none of those things are meant to fulfill us. That none of those things are worthy of our worship. We are made to worship and we are made to worship something worth that worship. And here's another thing to remember. Everything that we pursue apart from or in addition to God, it takes us to the same place. So it costs the same and it takes us to the same place. By far the worst consequence of choosing to follow that other than God thing, whatever this is over here, that thing is, is the, by far the worst consequence is that it will quite literally send you to the grave. 
You will have wasted your life on something that not only didn't deliver on its promise, but also distracted you from the one thing that could have made a difference and saved your life. We are destined to die in our sin apart from Jesus Christ. You can fill in that blank with anything. Choose to worship anything other than God, other than the, the name of Jesus Christ, and that will ultimately send you to hell. So just like in Joshua 24, it's decision time. Not because we are in a church, not because the right people and the right equation, the right, everything's right this morning, but because any moment is the right moment to make this decision. Any moment you decide to get off the fence and to fully surrender your heart and your life to Jesus is a great time. To follow God means to put your faith in the one who died for your sins, Jesus, and submit your whole life to him. And if you want to talk or you want to pray about through a decision, I will be up here in front uh, at, here at the, after this service this morning, and I, I'd love the opportunity to, to talk or to pray with you to flesh out what this means, what it looks like to get off the fence, to choose this day who you will serve, who you will worship. And right now, I, as your pastor, I commit in my heart and before my church family that I will follow God and lead my family to do the same. I will embrace the bumps in the road, the sufferings and the persecutions that come. And more than that, like they do in, in the book of Acts, the, the apostles, I hope that I would be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. God, as you avail yourself to us, this morning. Through your word, you, you show us your faithfulness. You show us how wonderful and amazing you are. God, as we look at your promises and we look at their fulfillment, God, that we can point to your faithfulness and, and, and that speaks to our hearts, that encourages us, that gives us strength and endurance for the race. God, that we can look at you and we can walk knowing that you are worthy of our worship. We say it all the time, but you are worthy of our worship. Help us to be focused and devoted to you. Help us to worship you and you only. Not to be divided, not, be, not to be distracted. Help us to worship you and you only today. And if there's people here that are listening, Lord, that are, that are, that are they're listening to your word, listening to this truth, God, that you are calling to make a decision, to get off the fence, to follow, to recommit, to, to, to pursue you wholly and submit to you only. God, I pray that you would give them the, the boldness to do that, the faith to do that, the, the steadfastness. Give them the awareness of what that costs. But ultimately, God, I pray that you would show them your grace through the gospel, through Jesus Christ, that they, Jesus has died on a cross for their sins, that they can walk in a new life by your power. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you guys go ahead and stand?